The Phaeton seems like an enigma. Why would Volkswagen, whose name literally means people's car, make an expensive limousine? Just who is this car aimed at? But there is some method to the madness. Instead of a people's car, think of it more as a people's limousine. The Phaeton was built on a Bentley chassis, it drove like a Bentley, and it was just as sumptuous throughout. But it cost a cool £75,000 less at only £37,000. That's less than some Audi A6s. So just how much is a fancy badge worth to you? This is the Volkswagen Phaeton story. The Phaeton was the pet project of Ferdinand Piech, the chairman and CEO of Volkswagen Group. His grandfather was Ferdinand Porsche, the founder of the famous motor company, so it's natural he would start his career there. He worked on the 906 and laid the groundwork for the successful 917. He then moved to Audi, where he worked on the Audi 80 and 100. In 1977, he initiated the development of the rally-winning Audi Quattro, using a five-cylinder engine similar to the one he previously developed for Mercedes-Benz as a side project. All this success, and some Machiavellian moves in the background, led him to become the chairman of Volkswagen Group in 1993. At that time, VW was in deep financial trouble, and Ferdinand staged a dramatic turnaround, making it one of the most successful car companies in the world. To give you an idea about how successful it's become, here's the 2019 revenue for Audi, BMW and Mercedes-Benz. That's essentially the value of the vehicles they sold. But what's important to each company is the profit that they made. Audi is way more profitable, almost eclipsing BMW. But BMW owns other car marks, such as Mini, so it's fairer to compare the VW Group, BMW and the Daimler Group that owns Mercedes-Benz. And this shows just how much VW dwarfs both companies. This turnaround was instigated by Ferdinand Piech. He was responsible for the purchase of Bugatti, Lamborghini and for moving Audi up market. The 250 mile an hour, 1000 horsepower Bugatti Veyron was another of his pet projects. He was also responsible for the purchase of Rolls Royce and Bentley. In 1998, the owners of Rolls Royce, Vickers, wanted to sell the company. BMW was the most logical choice, as Rolls Royce used BMW engines, but BMW's £340 million offer was beaten by VW's with £430 million. Volkswagen now owned the two most prestigious car brands on the planet, and had beaten rival BMW into the process. But BMW had the last laugh. VW had purchased the crew factory, all the blueprints, and the necessary people and technology, but they'd missed one important detail. To license the name Rolls-Royce. This was still owned by Vickers, and was used on their successful jet engines. BMW swept in and purchased the Rolls-Royce name for much less than their original £340 million bid, just £40 million. And given that existing Rolls-Royce cars used aging technology, VW would have to throw out all the existing equipment and start from scratch. They'd got the Bentley name, but BMW had got a name that was arguably more prestigious, for around a tenth of the price. To add insult to injury, BMW's contract said that they could stop supplying engines for Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars with 12 months notice, and there wasn't an obvious replacement, so VW could only make Bentleys without an engine until they ramped up a new model. But VW did have the spirit of ecstasy and Rolls-Royce grill trademarks that BMW sorely wanted, so the two rivals entered into negotiations. VW would continue making Rolls Royces for the next five years to allow both companies to sort out this mess, and BMW would get their trademarks. Despite Ferdinand claiming he'd only ever wanted the Bentley name, he wasn't fooling anyone, and had egg all over his face from this expensive deal. I'd like to imagine VW's chief negotiator was put in the stocks and pelted with rotten fruit outside Volkswagen's main gates. But putting blunders like this to one side, Ferdinand was doing a bang-up job turning VW around. VW sales in the USA, and indeed around the world, got a shot in the arm due to projects under his watch like the fun VW Beetle reboot. 
So when a Volkswagen limousine was mooted in the late 1990s, no one was arguing when Ferdinand gave it the go-ahead. After all, most of what he'd done in his career had turned to gold, so why not take Volkswagen upmarket with a halo car to help sell its more reasonably priced models? There were other good reasons why this car could be useful. Mercedes-Benz were moving into the mainstream market with the A-Class. Volkswagen felt the quality of their cars was as good as anything BMW or Mercedes made, so why not beat them at their own game with a premium car? It was a sentiment other car makers were broaching at the time as well, such as Honda, who felt that their cars should be sold at a higher price to denote their better quality, at least in Honda's eyes. Of course, Volkswagen already had a premium brand, Audi. In fact, after Ferdinand's buying spree, they had several. But surely Audi would be the natural fit for the new car, which seems similar to the A8 they already produced. But in Volkswagen's eyes, the A8 was a pure driver's car, a competitor to BMW's 7 Series. The new car should be a laid-back limousine, akin to the Mercedes S-Class or Lexus LS. To ensure that the car was of the highest standard, Ferdinand Piech set out 10 criteria that a car had to meet. Only two of them were ever made public, that the car needed a high degree of torsional rigidity, and that the car could be driven at 300 km an hour for 24 hours with an outside temperature of 50 degrees C and an internal temperature of just 22 degrees C. The car was explored as Concept D. From the outside it looked like a hatchback Passat on steroids, being 38cm longer and 16cm wider. It was launched at the 1999 International Motor Show with a 313 horsepower 5 litre V10 diesel engine, driving all four wheels. It still used regular shock absorbers, but the springs were replaced by air suspension. This is similar to hydropneumatic suspension seen in Citroens, but uses air instead of fluid. Reaction to the car was good enough that Volkswagen decided to take it to production. The car would share the same chassis as the Bentley Continental GT and Flying Spur, and that chassis would be modified to create the Porsche Panamera. VW had spent £500 million renovating Bentley's crew factory, but the Phaeton, Bentley Continental GT and Flying Spur would be built at VW's newest and most radical facility, the Transparent Factory in Dresden. It looked nothing like any previous car factory, with glass letting in light from all directions, Canadian maple floors and a clinical, almost sanitary atmosphere. Car parts rolled along on autonomous sleds and even moved up and down floors on elevators to the next stage of production. Customers could watch the 550 workers while they assembled their vehicle, and VW even offered customer vacation packages. Once the car was produced, it could be stored in the rotunda by robotic lifters until it was needed. The transparent factory was also a cultural mecca, hosting orchestral and operatic events. This was a factory unlike any other, but with just 28 cars leaving the door every day, not one for mass production. The name for Volkswagen's extraordinary new car would be the Phaeton. The name came from the light, sporty, horse-drawn carriages from the 19th century. They were dangerous, so were named after the son of the Greek god Helios, who met his doom trying to master the wild sun chariot. 20th century Phaeton automobiles started out as fast, light, open-top vehicles, but by the time Audi predecessor Horsch produced their Phaeton in the 1930s, it was more of a grand tourer. The Volkswagen Phaeton certainly wasn't light or dangerous, but for its weight, 2500 kilograms, it was relatively fast. 60 could be reached in just 6 seconds, and it would go on to a rumoured unlimited top speed of over 200 miles an hour. The Phaeton would also be the most luxurious people's car ever produced. Volkswagen chose the finest quality wood and leather for the interior. The massaging electric front seats were air-conditioned. The heating could be individually tailored for each of the Phaeton's four occupants, and a dehumidifier prevented the windows from fogging up. The entertainment system used a large colour screen when these were a relative luxury, offering an excellent audio system, navigation, phone integration and TV reception where it was allowed. Mechanically, all cars were four-wheel drive, using a V10 diesel or a V6, V8 or the wild 6-litre W12 petrol engine. 
Depending upon the engine, the car used either five or six speed automatic gearboxes. Some of the engines and transmissions would be shared with the Audi A8. And as with the Concept D, the car rode on air suspension. The Phaeton was also offered as a long wheelbase version that was stretched by 12 centimeters to offer more rear legroom. And those rear occupants would get their own climate controls. VW would probably have called the styling refined, but in reality it was a little bland, a conservative shape that was designed to offend as little as possible. The Phaeton was launched in 2002 to European customers, and it was slowly rolled out to international markets. The press were amazed at the car, but many wondered just who this car was designed for. It's flattering to compare the Phaeton to the much more expensive Bentley Continental GT that would be released a year later, but customers weren't making those comparisons. Despite the Phaeton being more a leisurely Grand Tourer, it was compared to the BMW 7 Series, Mercedes-Benz S-Class, Lexus LS, and indeed VW's own Audi A8. It could still beat each of them on price while offering the same level of refinement, but the power of a luxury brand badge is strong, both in aspirational value for the owner and resale value for the car. The Volkswagen badge just didn't have the cachet customers were looking for. Sales were a disappointment. The transparent factory had a capacity to make 20,000 cars a year, but Phaeton yearly production never got much higher than 6,000. In Europe, the sales were strongest in VW's home market of Germany. Abroad, the car was a massive flop in North America, being only sold from 2004 to 2006. But the Phaeton found most success in China and South Korea, where customers were happier to accept the Volkswagen badge on a premium car. A smaller 3.0-litre V6 diesel engine arrived in 2004, and in 2005 Volkswagen investigated the idea of making an even longer limousine version with a Phaeton Lounge. It featured seating for six, with two pairs of rear seats facing each other. Those passengers got a minibar, wine coolers, a cigar humidor, and a plethora of monitors with a DVD system. This was a world away from Volkswagen's first car. It was launched at the Middle East International Motor Show, but there wasn't sufficient demand to take it further. An update in 2007 gave the car automatic distance cruise control, which included a front assist collision avoidance system and a lane change assistant. The entry-level petrol V6 got a performance boost that brought the 0-60 time down below 9 seconds. The daytime running lights were changed to use LEDs, and that joined the rear lights that already used them. And finally, the CD navigation system got a bump in capacity as it was swapped out for a DVD system. The following year, another update appeared with a multimedia system that stored music on a 30 gigabyte hard drive. The car got a rear view camera as well as a freshened center console with revamped controls. Just two years after that, in 2010, it got yet another facelift, this time marketed as the new Phaeton. The changes and launch were supposed to be much grander, but the 2009 economic crisis put pay to that. It showed the importance that the Phaeton had in the Chinese market that it was launched at the Beijing International Automotive Exhibition. The front grille and rear lights were changed to match VW's current styling. As far as gadgets went, it got 3G mobile internet and traffic sign recognition. Shortly after that, the top-of-the-line W12 engine ended production, presumably because of low demand, leaving the V8 as the top-of-the-range engine. The final update appeared in 2014, but the changes were minor, probably just to keep up with the changes in engine technology that had been developed for other cars in the VW range. Volkswagen was going for bulletproof reliability and a higher quality than their usual cars. However, despite this goal, there were still problems. And although you weren't paying Bentley prices to get them fixed at your VW dealer, you weren't paying VW Passat prices either. And with all those luxury features, there was a lot to go wrong, which meant the used market was going to be severely depressed. Maybe that's why you can buy a Phaeton today for less than £2,000. And if you, like me, are thinking that that's a tempting idea for a cut price Bentley, remember you're buying a car with 2004 technology in it. Forget about Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, and the built-in navigation system likely won't know about any roads built after 2004 if the CD-ROM map data disk will still read. 
The Phaeton cost Volkswagen millions and it never returned that investment with lacklustre sales throughout its life. It's very similar to another pet project of Ferdinand Pieck, the Bugatti Veyron, that launched around the same time and also lost money. It's been estimated that VW lost £25,000 on each Phaeton it sold, but that pales into insignificance when you realise that they lost £4 million on each £1 million Bugatti Veyron. Yet the Veyron was hailed as a big success for VW and Bugatti, and sparked to the 300 mile an hour successor, the Bugatti Chiron, that I have to say makes a rather good Lego model. Yet the Phaeton was seen as one of Ferdinand's rare failures. By the time the car launched, he'd retired, as he was required to do so by German law when he reached 65 years of age. Yes, the Phaeton lost money, but how many additional sales did Volkswagen gain from having the Phaeton as a halo car to boost its prestige? The Phaeton ended production in 2016. A replacement was rumoured to be ready in the wings, but was cut with the chaos that surrounded the Dieselgate cheating scandal. The last Phaeton stayed at the transparent factory and was signed by all the workers to mark the end of this truly amazing vehicle. As this was the middle of Dieselgate, it's been suggested that the Phaeton production ended to allow the transparent factory to be turned over to focus on face-saving electric car research and production. Soon it was pumping out electric Golfs and the ID3, but at a low volume of just 70 cars a day. With the Phaeton selling moderately well in China, VW produced a replacement of sorts as the China exclusive Fideon. Rather than the Bentley chassis, the new car was based on the more humdrum Audi A6 and would be produced in China. At first for Volkswagen cars, it was equipped with its very own ghost detector, helping to reduce the terrible number of ghost fatalities on the road every year. Will there be another Phaeton? There have been rumours Volkswagen will recreate the Phaeton as an electric car with the ID Vision shown in 2019. The Phaeton was Volkswagen's experiment in making a people's limousine, but who wants a limo when you can't afford a driver? It was a sales disaster, but the Halo car and its special transparent factory helped to further raise VW's standing as a car maker. It was the vision of its autocratic leader, Ferdinand Piech, who got more right than he got wrong. Although that's it for the Phaeton story, while I was researching this video, I found a couple of interesting stories about Ferdinand Piech. Like many transformative leaders, Ferdinand Piech was, to be diplomatic, a difficult person to be around. He was abrasive and had problems in social situations. While working for Audi, he met with the Emperor of Japan and was shown one of the Emperor's swords. Ferdinand examined it and bluntly told the Emperor it was a fake. The Audi team forbade Ferdinand from taking part in any other public events during that trip, which incensed Piech as he was there to promote the Audi Avis Quattro that he had a large part in creating. Subsequently, the Emperor had the sword examined by experts who discovered that it was indeed a fake. Bob Lutz, one time president of Chrysler, once asked Piech how he achieved tight body tolerances on Volkswagen cars. Piech recounted a story about how he pulled all the top body engineers and their staff into his office. He gave them all an ultimatum that they'd be fired if all of VW's cars didn't have 3mm body tolerances within just six weeks. Sure enough, they met their goal. So when your manager does something that annoys you, thank your lucky stars you're not working for someone like this. This may also explain the corporate culture that allows something like the Dieselgate scandal to happen. If you have to get something done, no matter what, you will do anything. I know, this is the moment when you turn me off. You don't want to hear me banging on about subscriptions and Patrons, but there are links, you see? There are links, you can click on these if you want, or you subscribe down there. Um, but fair enough, whatever, you do your own thing, I'm off.